right click and control. If you don't care about watching the rest of this video, right click and control, I want you to have heard about. You can right click buildings, you can right click walls, you can right click fences, and it brings up this little overlay that will present you with most, not all, but most of the building controls that you have available for interacting with these objects. It might also show you some building controls that you can't otherwise access. Control. If I take this block, I can use control to disable snapping. So I bring it over here. It snaps to the building that is already present. I can press and hold left control on my keyboard and it disables that snapping. Disabling snapping also works on walls, also works on fences. It works on our free window varieties and it also works on the terrain tool. There is nothing else. That's what I wanted you to have heard about. Also, you can press Z or Z on your keyboard to undo and you can press X to redo. Those are the absolute basics that I want everybody to have heard. Now, hi, welcome. <laughs> this is Tiny Glade 101. In this video, I'm going to go through all of the building tools pretty much left to right. I'll show you what they do, how they interact with one another, what all of their controls are. So if you're playing Tiny Glade and you're completely lost on how this game even works mechanically, because so much of the stuff is hidden behind touching the right thing, some of it is hidden in these weird menus, how does any of this work, uh, this video might be for you. And if you've played Tiny Glade for a while, but it seems like every time that you see what somebody else has built, they have access to stuff that you don't. How do, how do they do that? This video might also be for you because some of these interactions can be a little obscure, so I wouldn't blame you for having missed them. But yeah, I'll be going through these left to right, with the exception that I'll show you the color options, which you use the color palette for on each object as we get to them, because otherwise there'll be a lot of backtracking. Now, with that said, I would love for this to be one take, but I can already see that it isn't going to be, so there'll be some cuts. With that said, let's get started on building controls. All right, building controls, building controls. Now, buildings, they come in round. They also come in rectangular. Now, before you even place a building down, you can hold left click and drag your mouse and that will change the dimensions of a block that you're holding before you even place it. So you can adjust it to already just about fit what you're trying to do. And it's also going to maintain that size until you next grab it. So if I keep it small, it stays small. If I make it big, it stays big. Now, once you've placed a block down, you can touch the sides to change the dimensions of the piece. For the round tower, that's going to make it thinner and thicker, respectively. Now, if you touch them at the bottom, then you can raise them off the ground or bring them back down. If you touch them at the top, you can make them taller, you can make them shorter. Same for the round piece. Now, for the square ones, if you touch them on the corner, they rotate. I keep wanting to call this an edge. If you touch them on the corner, they rotate. The round one doesn't have a corner, so it doesn't rotate. Now, if and when you right click these, you'll gain an extra option. There's this arrow down here. You can touch that to move the entire block to a different location. That is one control that is absent from a block by default. So you have to right click in order to use this one. But the other prompts in here are exactly what we've seen. There you go. Now, when you raise a block, let me actually take the square one, off of the ground, it will grow these supports in order to support itself. However, when you move that into another block, then it will grow this type of support to support itself. If you increase the distance from the wall, it will gain wooden supports. And if you increase the distance even further still, it will get its legs back. So from there, coloring. 
you can color these in. They come in different colors of bricks and different colors of washing. Now each washing color also has an associated brick color. So you're kind of getting a two for one deal. Now there's a couple of special options in here. This one that we're on, it creates these horizontal lines, which kind of indicate where a floor could go if you wanted it to. Also helps you line up things a little bit better. However, this blank option makes them disappear. This option creates half timbering. So now we have wooden supports in here and we've gained a new row of colors. So while this row still recolors the walls, this one changes the color of the wood. And if we go back to these three, if you change these to half timbering, you'll see that the corbels, the little stone supports, change to wood, and the long stone columns, those also change to wood. Now there's a couple of other differences between half timbering and stone walls. However, before we can talk about that, we need to talk about rooftops. Rooftops, you can touch them and drag them down makes them shorter, drag them up makes them taller. Now if you use the same prompt but you drag left and right, you can see they go convex and concave. Or you can try and tease it back to straight in the middle. Now if you touch these corners on the edge, whoops, then that can be brought together to get a point. It can be brought apart to get a gable and, you know, every conceivable degree in between. Now in the middle, you can click this to change the direction of the roof. So it runs this way or it runs that way. Now all of these are also in the right click menu, up, down, pointy, gable, direction. However, not the concave convex one. That's for one building control that's not in this right click menu. Now about differences. For one, if you look at the stone building back here and compare its gable to the half timbered gable, you'll see that they are different. For the stone one, the wall overlaps the tiles. For this one, the tiles overlap the wall. And you can see that change back and forth like this. However, if you drag a rooftop all the way to the bottom, you'll get a flat roof. And for the half timbered building, that's a wooden railing. For the stone building, that's merlons and renellations. So, you know, battlements in the broadest sense of the word. But of course, rooftops also recolor. So there's that to consider as well. Now one thing that you need to know about the half timbering is that when you place a window on it, it sort of changes its pattern to adapt to where the window is placed. So the half timbering doesn't care if there's a window here, but if you put it through a support, it will generate a different set of supports to, I suppose, not leave it too blank. So keep that in mind when you place your windows. All right, first sequence break. I have three more notes on building stuff and controls that I want to get out here. So I've prepared a little something. As you can see here, these towers are perfectly centered with one another and this used to be quite difficult to achieve. However, nowadays I want to inform you, they snap to be centered with one another. As long as these two blocks intersect, they will snap to center with one another. So if I bring this up here, where it's just floating above the other block, doesn't work. But if I bring it down, even just like halfway down, then they will snap. This also works with rectangular buildings. In this case, they will snap to the middle line of the rooftop. However, if I bring these together to a point, then it will snap to the point. Quite simple, like that. 
Now, the other thing that I think a lot of people are really going to find useful, so much so that I featured it in one of my other videos, and I kind of messed it up, or rather I kind of overdid it, so here it is again. These flowers that generate at the bottoms of buildings. Let me just lift all of this out of the way, and the greenery disappears. Now, you can get rid of it, of course, by lifting it up a little bit, but if you just, like, click and hold this control point for a second, that already makes most of the plants disappear. In fact, yeah, this one was actually feeding off of that block. So be aware of that if you are getting plants and you don't want plants. You can just like click and hold the control point for raising the block and that will get rid of most of the bushes. Now the one thing that you will notice is that you do get this line at the bottom, which is sort of the foundation layer of a block. You don't get that one when the block is on the ground. But that, honestly, is a bit of a minor difference beyond the fact that the door handles are now a bit short. But yeah, you can lift the blocks, even just a tiny amount, and it will get rid of plants. That's number two. Number three is about intersection. So when you have two blocks that intersect with one another, let me just increase the angle here slightly so we can see better, they will generate this row of bricks along their seam and they will do the same, let me move him out of here, for the rooftop tiles. So be aware of that and also be aware that these are colored, <clears throat> that these are colored contextually. So if I color this one in purple, now the tiles are one red, one purple, one red, one purple, and so on. If I color this one in in black, the bricks become one black, one white, one black, one white, and they sort of do this alternating pattern that we might also see again later. <laughs> However, where this might trip you up is if you have a rooftop like this, where the rooftop tiles intersect a wall. Because if I color this one in in blue, you'll see it also gets one red, one blue, one red, one blue, because the block that it's intersecting has a red rooftop. And this is also still the case if I completely take out the roof. If the roof is completely flat, it will still force its color onto any roof that intersects it. So stay aware of this. If you have two buildings that intersect and you're like, why is it giving me this changing pattern of rooftop tile colors? Uh, this might be the reason. You may not think that the block has a roof, but it does. Anyway, the reason why I had these the way they were originally is because at very shallow angles, like if I go up here, the very shallow angle at which these two meet. For some reason, uh, you don't get bricks in the seam. And I don't know if it's intended or not, but it is true. You know, you can sort of see the seam in the whitewashing, but you don't get the column of bricks that you normally do. So that's three more notes on building controls. With that, let us move on. Except that I lied, and before we can get into walls, there's one more thing. If you have two flat rooftops, and they overlap, they overlap, then you can see that they delete their decorations on the edge. So the railing and the merlons both disappear so that you can have a single flat roof made up of different pieces. And this actually continues like this for quite some distance. So, there you go. Can bring them about a this far apart before they actually start changing. Now, one thing you should know is that this doesn't happen if they don't intersect at all. So, while like this, it disappears. If you have it like this, it doesn't. Because those, essentially those two blocks don't even know that they exist next to each other. Kind of. But yeah, that's the last thing that you need to know about building controls on the building blocks. Let us move from this to walls. Walls, you can draw them. And when you draw them, you can continue drawing them from one of these end nodes. 
However, you can also hold control if you don't want to do that to unsnap your cursor from this control node and draw a separate piece without continuing this one. However, if you don't disable snapping, you can also snap one piece to another. And if I let go now, they join and become one. If I don't do that, if I hold left control to disable snapping, they'll stay quite separate. Now, one thing you may have seen in there is that when I right click these walls, I get some controls. One of them is the arrow that we've already seen. The other one is the wall height, so walls can go up. However, there is no bottom one. You can't raise the wall off of the ground. You can only make it taller. And there's these nodes in here, which actually are the nodes that determine the shape of your wall. So if you need to do some fine adjustments, you can use that to do it. Now the walls also color in, in different colors of bricks and different colors of washing. There's also the horizontal indicator line. However, there's no half timbering option. The fences work essentially in the same way. So you draw them, they snap to one another, you can unsnap them from one another. Your cursor snaps to them, you can unsnap your cursor from them. Everything just about the same. However, their maximum height is a lot more limited. But yeah, they're pretty much just walls, but made out of wood. So anything that you can do with walls, you can generally also do with fences, apart from windows, but we'll get to that. So, these also color in. Let us get all right, second sequence break of the day. A couple more notes on walls. One thing that I forgot to mention, when you have right clicked a wall, yes, you have these control points down here and this is the height control. However, there is a third control in the middle, this little scissors gizmo. So when you have these scissors, if you click, you can cut the wall apart into its constituent parts, I suppose. You can keep subdividing it like this. So if you have a little bit too much wall or you have a section in the middle of a wall that you don't like, you don't necessarily need any of the erasers. You can cut those parts out or otherwise if you need smaller bits of wall. Now this also works for fence. So just stay aware of that. The scissors option only available in the right click menu, but very useful. Now the other thing is a little bit more obscure. Walls have, for lack of a better word, a directionality. They have a left side and a right side. So it makes a difference if you draw your wall from right to left or left to right. And you can't see this difference until you take a window and you put it on both walls. Doesn't look any different. Double window doesn't look any different. Triple window on this wall comes out on this side, on this wall it comes out on this side. So if we go back a bit, we'll see, I draw the wall right to left and the window comes out here on the right side from the direction that I was drawing in. And if I draw it left to right, and I put a window in it, then it also comes out on the right side of where I was drawing. So stay aware of that. Um, the right side is where this window will pop out. It's a bit of an obscure one, but a lot of people have stumbled across it. Now, I've made a couple extra preparations, but with a path tool, you can select it and you have this slider on the smallest size. It's quite diminutive, but at the largest size it gets a little bit bigger. You can also hit the arrow to reset it, of course. Now what it does is it turns your grass into a sort of trodden dirt path. And there's a couple of things that this does. If you drag a path through a fence, it makes this sort of gate or 
arch. If you do the same to a freestanding wall, it also makes an arch. Now you can raise these up and bring them back down. However, you might notice that for the fence, the height of the fence that you can attain is much smaller than the one that the arch is capable of. So do stay aware of that. Now, when you drag the path into a building, it will make a door and we'll get to that. However, if you draw it too wide, it becomes arches as well. If you drag it across a low roof like this, the path will make you some stairs. You can actually see on the side of this block the indicator for when it's ready to take stairs. So at this tall, you can see that this little skirt of bricks disappears at the same time as the stairs do. This is the indicator that the block is low enough to spawn you stairs. Anything higher will make you doors and arches, but down here you get stairs of varying heights. Now, if you take your path across water, it will create these little rocks. And if you keep drawing on it, you can give them a little extra height. Now, the path will also destroy any trees and flowers in its way. Goes for the automatically generated flowers as well as for the ones that you place with a brush. And if you go up terrain, it will make itself little stairs to get up there. However, if the terrain is flat enough, then it will not. Now, the final thing is, if you have water and you have a wall and you have path, it won't make you a door in the water, but instead it will make you this little sewer grate type deal where you have the metal bars going up and down. And that should be everything on paths. So with paths we can now talk about doors and these doors already recolor. I'll let you know right now. The path does not recolor, but the other doors will. So let's do doors and this will actually preempt some of the window stuff because this is the one variant of door that you have. This one that you draw with the path tool. However, you can also use your windows as doors. So if you take a window and let me actually get this bush out of here so that we can see. If you take this window and you bring it down to floor level, it will also become a door. And this door comes in three sizes like we've seen, like we haven't seen, like we will see with the windows as well. However, there's also this pointy window which will give you a pointy door and that pointy door also comes in three sizes that I can't quite fit in here. There you go. Oh, there you go. Three sizes. Wonderful. Now, these doors also go in water. So if I take this back here a little bit, they go in water and they'll generate themselves like a little staircase in order to get down there. And the doors will also go on top of balconies. So here we have these balconies. A flat roof that intersects with a wall and you can put a door onto this. You can also put a door at the bottom of a floating block like this. So here we have a block that's off the ground and it has this bottom edge, right? So if you take a window and you take it down here, it also becomes a door, but with a little balcony type railing in front. And over here, that's why I widened this block a little bit. You can see what that looks like on the largest size of the largest door. Now these don't make doors, it's just these two and we'll get to what makes them different in a second. However, there's one more door to talk about. If you take a window and you put it on top of a flat roof, you get a trap door. And the cottage one is sort of plain and basic and the pointy gothic window one has a little bit more metal flourish on it. And that is doors. They do, of course, recolor. 
just like this one did, so you can adjust them to taste. So that is doors. Let's talk about what we used to make those doors. Let's talk about windows. All right, let us talk about windows and full disclosure. As I was beginning to edit this video, an update came out for the game uh, that changed a bit about Windows. So sequence break here, um, I'm re-recording the Windows segment to include that new information. So Windows, they come in three varieties. We got square, we got pointy, we got arrow hole, I suppose. Here's square, it's also called cottage window. This is a gothic window. And that's the arrow hole. Now windows you can combine. You take two windows, grab one of them, combine them, double window. You can also just add them to one another like this. You know, you don't need to place it first and then bring it over. Same goes for the gothic windows and also the arrow hole. So I size up like this. Now for the square window, there's also corner varieties, like this, and all of the windows, with the exception of the arrow hole, also have half dormer and dormer varieties. We put these three up here, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. Now, if you ever see this tooltip, that's just the game telling you that this object doesn't fit here. So it's trying to tell me that the top of a window that I'm holding is exceeding the line of the ridge of the roof. If you, ever, if you ever see this, that's what that is trying to communicate. Now, the arrow holes are different. The arrow hole, it doesn't go as a half dormer, doesn't go as a dormer. However, the arrow slit goes as a half dormer, doesn't go as a dormer. And same for the triple, goes as a half dormer, doesn't get any higher. All right. Also, just for completeness sake, the gothic window and the arrow slit don't go on corners. Now, you can use control to disable snapping on windows. So if I wanted to place these two next to one another, if I wanted to stop them from combining like this, I just hold control and that allows me to place them like this. The other thing that control does is if I have a window already combined, it will open up this little overlay and I can pull one window out of it. So if you want to break apart your combined window, you also use control for that. So let's talk about decorations. The cottage windows come with decorations, the gothic windows and the arrow holes don't. So they come in blank and clothesline and... Oh, he's playing hard to get. There you go. <laughs> Flower box. <laughs> Same for the double sized one, though this one also has shutters or no shutters. So this is blank with shutters, this is clothesline without, this is clothesline with shutters. And if we try long enough, we should also be able to get flower box without. There you go. However, the double window does not have a flower box and shutters variety for some reason. Now, the triple window only comes with or without flower box. So those are our only two options. The half dormers behave the same way as the wall windows in terms of decoration variety. There you go, getting and getting it out. The corner ones also behave just the way that the wall ones do, except that the double one does not generate shutters on the corner. And the full dormers only come in blank or flower pot. All right. One last thing you should know about decorations is that if you have one cottage window with a clothesline and another cottage window with a clothesline, they will connect like this. So this one has a clothesline, that one has a clothesline. I bring them together and they will connect like this. They'll do it on the same wall, they'll do it on different walls. They'll just sort of see who they want to pair up with and it's not always the one that you expect. The other thing about decorations is that you may have noticed we've had a couple of spawns down here. 
And if you remember the path segment, something also spawned when I placed this door in a wall. And that's, that's what windows and doors do. Windows and doors kind of look at the ground around them and spawn items there as extra decoration. And you can click them the same way that you can click windows in order to regenerate what decoration is on them. You can also click them to regenerate what clutter items they spawn on the ground. The only exception to this is this door because it's you know technically a different sort of item. I can click this one as much as I want and it's just like, oh, you want to adjust the arch? Sure. But this doesn't actually change anything about what it's generating. The only way you can try to control that is by varying how you've drawn the path, but don't know how far you'll get with that. Anyway, let's talk about colors. Because while you might think that it's pointless to click a gothic window if it doesn't have different color varieties, sorry, already gave it away, different decoration varieties, it does have different color varieties. So all of the windows have the same color options. However, the arrow slit and the gothic window have one extra one. This blank color at the top just means that the window will match whatever color the wall behind it is. So like I've said before, every wall, even the washed ones, have an associated brick color. And that's the color at play here. If I change this to yellow, the gothic windows and the arrow slits turn yellow. If I give it this little peach color, yeah, they change to match. And because the bricks have color variations, you can see here on the right, it's a little whiter. On the left, it's a little greener. The windows, when they match the brick color, also have color variations and you can click them to change what color variation it's currently on. So if you have a window that's a little too green for the white wall that it's on, for example, then you can click it and try for a better tone like that. Same goes for the arrow slits. But beyond that, windows just color in. Now I'll tell you what this second row of colors is in a second, but first one more thing about gothic windows. You may have noticed that this window has a frame around it like this. And when you have a half timbered building like I do here, the color of that frame is matched to the color of the timbering. But when you have a masonry building, the color of that frame is matched to the masonry. And it also changes when you click it. So if I set this completely blank, you can see that both of them change. Just so that you know what effects those. Now, the other color option is for the light that's streaming out of the building at night. So you can see that these windows briefly, quote unquote, turn on when I hover over these colors. And that's just so that I can see what I'm selecting. However, it takes until we go to the middle of the night that we can see what we've actually done. Windows come with different light now. That, that was part of a big update. Um, so that's how you control that. Now, two more notes, one of which is actually, actually one more note on color. <laughs> Almost forgot it again. The bay window has little roof tiles on top of it and both those roof tiles will always be matched to the building that it's sitting on. So if I change this roof to green, it changes to green down here. If I change this to red, it goes red and so on. So these two are tied together the same way that the frame on the gothic window is tied to the color of the wall. Now two more notes. One note is on wall sidedness, because as we've already discussed, I think at this point in the video, it affects the dormers, sorry, the bay window, really starting to mess this up. It affects the bay window, but it also affects the door. So as you can see, the doorknob is on the right side of the wall. And if I draw it the other way, the doorknob is again going to be on the right side of the wall. But because I drew this in a different direction, now it's quote unquote correct from this perspective. That's the one thing. The other thing is, and this will come up again later, but 
If you turn a building into a ruin while it has windows on it, all of the windows will go glassless. So they just become completely see-through, completely ruined. And you can sort of see part of that ruined aesthetic, especially on the square ones. All right, but those are two last notes on windows. Let us get back to uh, pass to me and the rest of this video. All right, so let's talk about lanterns. Now lanterns go on the ground. They have one control node on the bottom, which you can click and drag to move the lantern somewhere else. They have another node up here, which you can click and hold in order to rotate it. Now lanterns also go on the sides of walls, where they will sort of hang out like that. And they also go on the corners of walls. In addition to that, you can also just drop them on the floor on a flat roof piece like this. Now here's a freebie. This is actually from my other video. If you have a lantern like this, you can't place this on a flat roof like this because it'll just drop to the floor. However, if this is already here and we move the floor over top, it won't actually disappear. It'll be a little shorter, of course, but, you know, might well make use of that. Hint, hint. Anyway, they do recolor. However, the only thing that you're recoloring is the color that it glows in. So if I set this to green and that one to red and we bring this entire map to night, then you'll see this one lights up yellow, this one's green, that one's red. And that's all that lanterns do. So let us quickly jump over to flags, which are very similar to lanterns to be fair. Flag goes on the ground, has one control node for moving it, has another up here for rotating it. Now you can also place flags on the sides of walls and they will sort of adapt their length to whatever is around it. So down here it doesn't want to overlap the door so it gets quite short. Same thing here really. And here it has a little more space in between, so it kind of swoops down to take up as much space as it wants. Now the same goes for flags that you place on the corners of buildings. And here is a spoiler, they do the same clothesline trick, but you can also place them on rooftops, whether they are sloped, whether they are flat. And also up here they will actually help you a little bit by snapping to the top of the ridge line which you can't actually unsnap with control i was curious about that i was thinking about that as i came to the section but yeah those don't unsnap anyway yeah they snap to the top of the roof anyway they of course recolor and when you have these buntings between two flags the color will alternate between whatever two flags make up these buntings. Now these work the exact same way as clothesline. It's essentially just a uh, distance calculation. However, you can tell them to cut it out. That's uh, this option here on the color wheel. And for some of them, like this one on the wall, you will actually gain a little indicator that's showing you that a bunting generation is turned off. So you can see as I play with this one. It appears and disappears. And I believe same is true for this one, but you don't get an indicator on this one and you don't get an indicator on these ones because these don't actually generate buntings at all. All right, so that's flags and that is buntings. However, one more thing you might want to know is that if you click the control node, it will change the motif and there's sort of four parts to the motif there's like the background there is these on the side there's the middle motif and then there's this bottom one i'm not entirely certain how each of them relates to the others whether they all randomize or if there's a couple tied to one another don't ask me but you click this button to change them and it will also change the patterns on the buntings in between but yeah, that, in short, is flags. 
So from there, let's get to chimneys. Now chimneys, let's start this over here. You can place them on buildings and they have two control nodes. One is down here, one is up here. So with this one, you can shorten and lengthen this bottom section, which is, I suppose, sort of the back of the oven. And if you move this too high altogether, then the chimney will just hang off of a wall. It won't have this bottom piece anymore. This top control node just changes how far it extends from the rooftop. Now we can also just place them like this in the first place. And of course, they also go on the tops of roofs, whether they are slanted or flat. Now, the very special thing about chimneys is that if they don't have enough space to be chimneys, they become smaller chimneys, to be fair. <laughs> still chimneys but you know if I slide this in here it's mostly a calculation of whether the chimney can get to the edge of the roof unobstructed at least that's how I understand it so if I take let's say a flag and I move it in here the chimney becomes small if I take let's say an, an arrow hole move it in here it becomes small again and this is my favorite way of using it because you, you can sort of hide these pretty well and you know you barely see, especially if the chimney is right in front of it. But yeah, if a chimney doesn't have space vertically to be a chimney, or even if you just place them too close to one another, then, let me do that over here, they become small chimneys. And actually, let me check that up here. Yeah, it doesn't work on the tops of rooftops. I thought not, but I just wanted to reconfirm <laughs> All right, last note, they recolor, of course, so you can color them in any color that the bricks come in. However, the little ones don't. Those are always this sort of copper tone. But yeah, that's lanterns, that's flags, that's chimneys. Now we can move on to terrain. So let us get to terrain. Now I had already prepared some terrain here earlier. You grab the terrain brush and you sort of lay down a stroke however you want your hill to be. And then you can grab this and pull it up to make it taller and you can push it back down to make it smaller. And if you push it all the way down, that's how you make it disappear. This terrain stroke is gone. I can't interact with it anymore. Now if you drag your mouse left and right, that changes how steep the slopes on the side of your terrain stroke are going to be. So all the way to the left, that's about as sheer as you can get these cliffs, and all the way to the right, and it's a very sort of gentle curve up the hill. Now, when you already have terrain placed down like this, you can hold left control to unsnap your cursor from this terrain, and that's how you lay terrain on top of terrain and that's all there is to that. So, let us jump over to flowers, though I will note there's no eraser for terrain, so you gotta work additively. You can't take away from it again other than completely removing a stroke and redoing it. Be aware of that. There's currently no terrain eraser. But the flower brush, the flower brush, it goes small, it goes big, it resets, the same as the path brush. Now, if you drag this across the ground, it will sort of create this gentle ground covering of flowers, petals, some small bushes. However, if you drag over it once and then twice, it gets a lot thicker and you sort of gain these blue flowers in the middle. So, you know, if you give it a second pass, you can expect a lot more greenery than before. Now with water, the flower brush will add you these little sort of lily pads, but that is really all that the flowers do. Beyond, I suppose, getting deleted by path, but we already talked about that. So from there, the tree tool, you can place trees with it, who would have thought, and it'll sort of give you a random tree each time. 
and what trees exactly it gives you does depend on what glade you're on. So I'm in summer now, so it will mostly just give me these very green trees. If I was in Olden, for example, I might get a couple of dead ones in there, which are, you know, just branches without any leaves on them. One thing I will note, which is also in my other video, is that the tree tool does not spit out every tree variety that the game has. So your glade may generate with some trees that if you delete them, the tree tool won't be able to give you back. Just stay aware of that, especially if you're somebody who likes to erase all the trees at the start in order to have a clean building area. You might lose some trees that you can't get back. But yeah, it gives you a random tree every time, so if you want a specific one, you know, you can undo, try again, undo, try again, until you get one that's just right for you. They have a little control point on the bottom to move them around, and I suppose this is also an interaction if you move them into water. It will generate a couple of extra reeds and lily pads. But yeah, that's the tree tool. So, moving on to the water tool. This also has a size, goes small, goes large, and it resets. Now the larger the water, the deeper it gets. You can sort of see how it gets darker in the middle. Your water will attract ducks, there's fish in it. But yeah, that's water. The one thing that's sort of interesting about water is that you can't place it on top of terrain. It instead just cut straight through it. So the water is sort of always at this height, which means that you can use it to get some pretty nutty uh, cliffs or boulders, depending on what exactly you're going for. But these can get quite pointy and quite steep. But yeah, that's the water tool. Now, before I move on into the photo mode and this menu, let's talk about erasers a little bit. Now, the erasers do exactly what it says on the lid. They erase things. So the flower eraser erases flowers. The tree eraser erases trees. The water eraser erases water. So on and so forth. Path does path. And wall does wall. However, we'll get to wall in a second here. The hammer is sort of special because the hammer will just destroy whatever object you're looking at. So if I take the hammer to this block here, it'll destroy the entire block and everything that's on it. Same for this building, same for the trees as I demonstrated. The hammer pretty much is just your instant delete button. Now, what this wall eraser also does is that if you take it to a building block like this, it will convert it into broken wall like this. So the roof will disappear if there's any floating bits. Those will drop to the floor, as I can demonstrate here. So that balcony just drop down. And that's how you can turn your buildings into ruins. And when you have turned your buildings into ruins, you may notice that, first of all, this type of door just disappears. And also, all of the windows become hollow. You know, that's just sort of what the windows look like. When they don't have a building on the inside. They just sort of become empty frames that you can see through. Alright, welcome to the final section of the video. Here's just four more notes, uh, three of which I have other people to thank for because I gave them an early cut of my video and I asked them what am I missing, what should I include and they gave me a couple of suggestions. So we'll go through these here and then I have one more that I want to make a note of myself. So first note, if you're not aware of it, there's hotkeys, so you can hit 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and so on on your keyboard in order to select these tools. And if you keep hitting 1, for example, it will cycle through the different items in this category. Now the second note is on rooftop interactions. So back here you may recall that I showed you how 
the rooftops delete their kind of corner decoration in order to create a flat roof. One thing you might want to know is that you can create a completely flat block if you want it. So let me take two pieces that are of identical size simply because it makes it easier to get it right immediately. You don't have to make this one flat, but it's kind of most convenient when it is. If you have two blocks that perfectly match each other in terms of size, then they will both delete each other's merlons in this case, and you'll end up with a piece that is completely flat on top. Now, I say perfectly, there's technically a little bit of wiggle room, but so little that you can pretty much consider it perfect. If you perfectly match them, it becomes perfectly flat. Now, the other thing that I was told would be good to include is on this interaction between the path and the hillside where it creates stairs, do be aware that if your cliff is sharp enough, the terrain that you get if you start applying path to this sheer cliff face can get quite interesting actually from a visual standpoint. So if you want to play around with this, uh, do feel free. All it takes is some path, some terrain, a sheer cliff face, and you might just like what you create. And the last thing that I sort of want to include is how to bridge, because how to bridge is kind of one of the favorite questions on the Discord at the moment. So as you may have noticed in this game, there is no dedicated bridge block. So a bridge you would usually create by taking a block, making it sort of minimum height, making it flat on the top. And then this is sort of your road surface for the bridge. You know, think of it that way. I would make it half timbered so that you get the railings on either side. I think that looks more pedestrian in general. And the simplest bridge design that I have on offer uses one piece on the left, one piece on the right. One day I will do the directions the way that I actually demonstrate them <laughs> instead of just picking one at random. But yeah, if you move this piece onto these other two, once again, the railing and the merlons disappear so that you can quote unquote travel through. And then you just grab a bit of path to create a staircase so that you can get up here. And that's the world's most basic bridge design. And this staircase is the entire purpose of having one block on the left and one block on the right because you sort of want this middle piece to be floating, right? So that you can get a good bridge look that also has some distance to the ground. However, with a floating piece, you can't get a staircase up to it. So doing that by having two blocks on either side gets you both the stairs and the road in between. Like I said, this is very basic, but you know, that's what this video is about. I didn't call it Tiny Glade 101 for no reason. I had a reason and that's because this is the basics. I do have a couple of bridge designs up on my other video, the one titled 62 tips and tricks and whatever. So you can check that out. They aren't much more complicated than this, but you know, you might be interested in finding out more. There's also somebody else who did a video on bridges. I might just link that in the description. But yeah, that's how you build a bridge. So with that all being said and done, I have one more note. <laughs> I'll continue doing this as long as I live with all that being said and done. One more note, one more thing. Um, one of the people that I asked for what I should include in this video still also suggested that I point out that your objects as you hold them, they rotate with your camera. So if you want some, if you want to get something into a specific spot and with a specific orientation, you know, you aren't technically forced to place it down, then rotate it right and then sort of get it in there before you even place it. You know, you can rotate your camera and it will sort of rotate to match whichever way around 
when I have it. And that works for these flags, it works for the lanterns, and it also works for the building blocks. So, you know, be aware of that. Things rotate as you rotate the camera. But yeah, that's this video at an end. Um, I'll point it out right now. I didn't want this to be this long. Uh, I, it kept getting longer. Um, you know, I filmed all of the individual sections and I was kind of happy with each individual one. But when I then put them into my timeline back to back, I realized that I'm once again like wasting an hour of people's time. So uh, apologies. However, you know, perhaps yeah, yeah, I keep telling people, you know, this game is a little more complex than it really lets on. You know, you look in your toolbar and you're like, wow, round piece, square piece, wall. Wow, what do I get for windows? Two options and an arrow hole. You know, um, I keep trying to sell people that it's really, a, the game's more intricate than that. But, you know, to then give them all of my weird unintended mechanics in the 62 tips video also doesn't really sell the game conceptually. So perhaps the fact that, you know, demonstrating all the different interactions that are natively in the game, the fact that that takes us you know, a good 40, 50 minutes, close to an hour, whatever it ended up being in the end. You know, perhaps that's a bit of vindication. You know, perhaps the game is more complicated than people make it out to be sometimes. But yeah, thank you for tuning in. I hope that something in here was new for you. Um, if you've wa like, if you've watched this beginning to end, uh, and you're like, I, I already knew all of that. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry that I couldn't offer you anything uh, new and exciting. If you're watching this, uh, let's say, um, April of 2025, and you have discovered something that I've missed, uh, which is in the game, uh, please don't go in the comment section. <laughs> the game is still getting updates. <laughs> but if it is, uh, let's say... October 2024, do feel free, um, you know, I watched my video back and I've had two other people uh, whom I know and trust watch the, vi watch the video back and we think that this is feature complete. However, if you still realize that I've done goofed, let me know and I'll probably uh, bite myself in the arse. With all that being said and done, thank you very much for tuning in. And I'll see you again, probably for a building showcase. That was sort of what I next had on my list. Just kind of a couple of gentle walks through some of my other buildings. All right, thank you. Goodbye.